by some tea, and you're all invited to both the tea and the panel. Uh, the panel is on um, uh, 25 years after the Rajiv Gandhi danger of being talks. It's an assessment of the changing nature of India-China relationship in the 25 years. Uh, we have a, a small but distinguished panel of speakers. Uh, the chair is uh, Mr. Jairam Ramesh. The speakers are uh, Ronan Sen, former ambassador, uh, Shiv Shankar Menon, national secretary advisor, speaking of course in his first capacity, and uh, Professor Alka Acharya of JNU. So this will be at 11 o'clock here in this room, and anyone who wishes to come is, is most welcome. Before the talk, uh, she has been a teacher of history at Miranda House, Delhi University, and subsequently a UGC professorial fellow at the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library. <coughs> Currently, she is an independent scholar. Her very large body of work includes at least four books, uh, The Veiled Women, Shifting Gender Equations in Haryana, 1880 to 1980, published in 1994. Contentious Marriages, Eloping Couples, Gender, Caste, and Patriarchy in North India, 2009. Uh, Political Economy of Production and Reproduction, Caste, Custom, and Community in North India, 2011. And on a completely different theme, Colonial India and the Making of Empire Cinema, Image, Ideology, and Identity in 2000. She has chronicled the historical agency of peasant women and the formation of masculinities for the late colonial period, in a regressively patriarchal culture of northern India. Her historically informed insights are carried over into contemporary research and commentary on gendered conflict in Haryana today. Her understanding of how modernity has impacted patriarchally, patriarchally organized peasant castes and put notions of masculinity at risk can be followed in the issues of the Economic and Political Weekly and is cited as much by journalists and activists against caste and gender violence as they are by social scientists. Now, Prem does not let us settle down comfortably uh, into any taken-for-granted views on any issue. And today, again, her new research, which she is presenting to us, promises to surprise us with new expressions of female agency in uh, making claims over familial property. Uh, this is as much a surprise to us as it is to her, as the volume which she edited in 2009, Gender Discrimination in Land Ownership and Land Reforms in India, showed to us a very dispiriting picture of women in North India uh, who were unwilling or unable to assert property rights over agricultural land, despite a number of enabling legislations, especially the reform of the Hindu Succession Act. So, um, Thank you uh, very much for uh, all this introduction. Now, uh, I shall uh, read, and then uh, you could ask me the questions. The time has come to reevaluate the question of female inheritance afresh, especially in view of the increasing visibility of such cases. In Haryana, the rapidly changed and still changing political economy has had effect on the customary cultural patterns hitherto held sacrosanct in rural areas. Together, these have been magnetic enough for women to claim their inheritance and share in the property, and also for some men to activate the inheritance laws on behalf of, their wife, of, behalf of women. Cases are steadily growing where women are claiming their share even after several years of not claiming it and despite there being a male heir. This is in spite of the likely public censure which the family may have to endure. Cultural patterns and time-honored traditions are set to change and breached, though not without evoking strong reactions and protest. I shall analyze this change occurring since independence, locating it in the political economy based on my fieldwork, which managed to throw up surprising results even for me. I was alerted to the possibility of this change in view of the unprecedented rise in the so-called honor crimes and the demand of the Khaf and Chayats to amend the Hindu Marriage Act of 1955, which except for certain prohibited degrees of relationship had made legal individual settlement of marriage between two consenting heterosexual adults. 
I was alerted to this because of my historical knowledge that out of the two acts passed in quick succession, the Hindu Marriage Act 1955 and the Hindu Succession Act 1956, it was the latter which had aroused very strong passions and not the former, and had led to the demand of its abolition because it legally enabled a woman to inherit land with full proprietary rights to its disposal in her capacity as a daughter, sister, wife, mother, and widow. On the other hand, on the one hand, they tried to abolish it through the legislative procedures, and on the other, they accelerated the attempt through the caste and chayaks to control its fallout effects. This move to deprive women of their property rights cut across political parties and was attempted in 1967, 1979, and 1989. All these moves failed, but not the spirit behind it. So the question arises, why now, after more than half a century of its enactment, the Hindu marriage act should suddenly gain importance? In fact, when it was passed, it was denounced, not because it did not accommodate the marriage customs like the clan, village, or territorial exogamy, or caste endogamy, but because it awarded the right to divorce to a woman, same as a man, which had not really existed earlier. The question that arose in my mind was, why this objection now? What had happened which was making things extremely uncomfortable for the male populace of Haryana for them to, after so many years, attack the legally established marriage system? The answer was clear, that it was once again related to their primary concern about property. It was a roundabout way of protecting the patrilineal property from going into the other hands by demanding a change in the legal recognition provided to marriages under the Hindu Marriage Act or abolishing it altogether. In other words, the attempt was to gain greater control over the marriage of females. This act enabled the daughters and sisters to marry who they liked, and by so marrying, introduced fresh blood and new descent line to the husbands who would who could hardly be trusted to honor the tradition of a woman in not claiming her inheritance rights. The introduction, introduction of a rank outsider into the family who could and may lay claims to the property on behalf of his wife had to be stopped. As an outsider, he remains outside the influence of the family and caste community rules and ethics, which ensure a patrilineal inheritance. Similarly, Location of a married daughter within the natal village also spells danger to patrilineal inheritance as it facilitates and could lead to assumption of land inherited by her. Consequently, the restrictions on marriage practice in keeping with caste and customary codes have to be legally imposed. And this could only be done by amending the Hindu Marriage Act. As all attempts to amend alter or abolish the Hindu Succession Act, their primary concerns had come to nothing. I realized that the demand for the legal recognition of the caste and customary codes regulating marriages would have had the effect of negating the progressive fallout of the inheritance enablement law on female population. The immediate trigger to this assertion, as I'm sure you all know, was certainly provided by the low court indictment of the so-called honor crime and severe punishment of the perpetrators in the Manoj Babli case of 2006, which I'm sure you all know. But I was certain that there must have been sound underlying reasons for the huge opposition of the Kapanchat, which was specially visible after this case. The answer to this lay in understanding the changed, ever-changing situation in Haryana regarding female inheritance. And I found that cultural constraints and popular prejudices did not entirely prevent the daughters from 
taking claims to their property or the demise from making claims on behalf of their wives. Slowly, the changes were coming in. Despite the antagonism towards such situation remaining pronounced, the three cases which had surfaced even under the colonial regime had steadily grown in numbers in post-colonial India. In fact, in September 1979, good 23 years after the passing of the Hindu Succession Act, the Haryana Vidhan Sabha members testified to a trend showing the sons-in-law shifting to their wives' villages to claim land and the greed among people who, after the 1956 Act, wanted their sons to marry only those girls who had no brothers. The legislators also openly acknowledged violence and even murder of Ghajavai. However, statistics regarding the number of cases which may have actually been effectuated were neither provided nor are available. Thwarted in their attempts, the rural patriarchal forces had since the passing of the act of succession devised several ways to stem the progressive fallout of the legal enablement. Many advocates testified to the stream of male members with a potential female intelligence in tow to get them to write off their land claims in favor of the brothers in anticipation of the act enforcement. This is in the early days. The court, one of the routine questions asked before Likhat Parhat, that is formalization of rights, takes place. Is tum khush ho ka bhaiyon ko de rahi ho? And the girl replied, yes. Several different sale deeds were rejected in favor of male members at this time. In other cases, the land is automatically registered in the girl's name, but remains in de facto position of the brother. Violence and compulsion have also been very effective in making the female sign away the rights. An important way has been to post the inheritance rights of a daughter and a sister to be against as of a brother, as also the alleged substitution of dowry as an alternative settlement of a girl's claim or right to property. Finally, a way to eliminate all the future property-related claims of girl was to what to and remains their elimination in the womb itself, the horrific female feticide, encouraged, as we all know, by modern technology. Yet there is evidence that things are changing. How and why is the main question here? What is the viewpoint of men and women now? regarding the inheritance of property. There are no straightforward answers, and it is still an ambiguous territory. But changes are perceptible. I had the occasion to ascertain this during my recent fieldwork done in mid-2011. However, the dominant attitudes regarding women inheriting property remains the same as before. I discovered that in the group discussions, Men frankly admitted that they, whether as father, brother, husband, or son, would not want women to have property. They openly acknowledged that it would give women tremendous leverage. And we have to be not That is literally the last one ahead. Also, there seems to be uh, also there seems to be an overwhelming unanimity about the inappropriateness of girls getting property from two sources. Parents and in law. Why should women get two shares? Isn't it enough that we get the marriage? They ask. With dowry, men do not have so much problem as that gives them much thought after status. It is a woman's claim to property that continues to remain under attack. The men share in the parental property to be abolished, which according to them must go to the male legal heirs. The apprehension of men about their patriarchal power and authority being compromised are quite evident. But as the changes now surfacing, can I have some water? Thank you. But as the changes are now surfacing noticeably, they have no option but to either accept it or to physically eliminate the woman. 
Confirming this, women stated, land or its position is the cause of a death. Thank you. And cited several cases from different places where women were allegedly killed for property. Many women in group discussions. That a daughter should have the right of property only at the time, not in her market. Others also maintain only if a girl is not married, she has the right to her parental property. Condemning those women who are now demanding their share, another woman maintained, Shri Kaho, Bhayam ki derurat to parash hai, unke bina kya karash hai, aise pise ka ke karna, jo admi ne kho di. Whatever may be, one needs his brothers. One cannot do without them. What good is this money which cuts up your relationship with your natal males? A country opinion does exist. I shall talk about it presently. But it's not being readily voiced. They prefer to maintain silence for fear of being shouted down or even ostracized. However, the time has come to re-evaluate the question of female inheritance of flesh, especially in view of the increasing visibility of such cases. These cases have to be located in the changed political economy of today, as the customary norms governing questions of inheritance and property of women have been undergoing change. What are these changes? As an explanation, I wish to emphasize just a few aspects in the changed political economy of this region that have direct bearing on this aspect. A single most important change which has had most profound effect is due to the enormous increase in land prices in Haryana, which has brought a rethink among, among women of claiming their share. The increase in the prices of agricultural land for urban purposes in the surrounding, in the area surrounding Delhi, as well as major towns of Haryana itself, has been unparalleled. Not only have the number of towns grown in the state from 58 in 1961 to 106 in 2001, there has also been a steady growth of urban population of Haryana. Statistically, there has been more than threefold increase in population in the towns since the creation of the state in 1966. In the last decade alone, for which the figures are available, that is 1990 to 2001, the urban area has increased from 967 kilometers to 1,288 kilometers, a growth of nearly 34 percent. Even more importantly, out of 19 districts of Haryana, Seven fall in the national capital region, that is NCR, containing more than 41% of the total population of Haryana. This NCR region of the state contains 40 towns and 2,496 villages out of a total of 106 towns and 6,955 villages in Haryana. In other words, 38% of the towns and 36% of the villages of Haryana are included in the NCR. It covers about 31% of the total area of the state. These areas have seen massive escalation in land prices. Land around major NCR towns in Haryana like Panipat, Sonipat, Rotak, Bahadurgarh, Rivari, Gurgaon and Faridabad is now being me measured in square yards rather than in acres as done previously and has enormous price tags due to demands of urban, residential, commercial and industrial expansion. Also in villages like Dujana of District Jhajjar, for example, one acre of cultivatable land today is, that is 2011 when I did the field work, is estimated to approximate close to a crore of rupees. It rose from 35,000 rupees in 1988, whereas the cost of this land was less than 1,000 rupees in 1966 when the state was created. Similarly, in Karnal district, 
the center of green revolution, the price of one acre is estimated to have risen from anything between 2,000 to 4,000 rupees per acre available before the green revolution to 50,000 and one black and above as a result of the green revolution and now in 2011 it stands well over a crore of rupees. You can see the difference. This land and, land and income hunger are reinforced by the driving social expenditure along with the growing demands of a new generation with the taste of urban life and consumerism. The rapidly changed and still changing socio-political economy has had effect on the customary cultural patterns hitherto held sacrosanct in rural areas. Together, these have been magnetic enough for women to claim their inheritance and share the property, and also some men to activate the inheritance law on behalf of their wife, wives. So much so that even the children have reclaimed, as is legally reclaimable, the once orally declined share by the mother. As a woman astutely commented in village Mandoti, Mandoti, पहले लड़कियां मांगती जरूर थी पर लेती ना थी ये लड़कियां अपना हक मांगती हैं और ले भी रही हैं earlier the girls were asking for their share but not claiming it now the girls are asking for their share and even claiming it this is a change noticeably cut to the surface and in the long term stands to readjust social equations between males and females most village uh, most men in village chara which is my village of district judge stated that in case of the death of the patriarch, the Patwari automatically registers the ancestral name in the name of the survivor, be it a girl or a boy. The girls nowadays, however, are extremely reluctant to transfer this land to their brother as they had done in the past and in fact so many cases in so many cases they have refused to oblige. The exact words used were This is commonly heard not only in Chara village but also in the surrounding villages. Such actions according to the local populace are driving a wedge between brothers and sisters and vitiating their relationship. It is ironical that for a sister to keep good relations with her brother, she must relinquish her share of property or the same brother-sister love is all but extinguished. Interestingly, women must still write off or feel compelled to write off their land rights, but they are now demanding a share in the sale of the land which has brought huge economic returns in the NCR region. In Village Baniara of Rosic District, for example, which falls under the acquisition of land plans of the Haryana government, there has been enormous rise in the price of land. These highly attractive commercial prices have reportedly elicited a response from females resulting in about 10 to 15 married women in the single village to stake their claim for their share in the money which their brothers' fathers have received from the sale of the land. Many women are known to have already received this money. However, there is a shroud of silence regarding this exchange as there continues to be social censure of all such demands. The concerned parties are wary of admitting that they have had to accommodate the demands of their family females. There is consequent denial by those concerned, but many people in the know have confirmed it. In this respect, I shall take up just one case in which the female claimant has made the demand, which highlights the pulls and pressures experienced by the female in order to either strengthen her agency or to, uh, to create it. Out of many cases that reportedly exist, she alone was willing to be interviewed. Rekha from village Rastana in Sonipur district was married to Rajbir, a policeman of village Lat in the same district. Her father originally had nine acres of land, out of which six acres were sold off for one lakh per acre, much before her marriage. However, with the passage of time, 
urbanization of Sunipat, and its industrial development and commercialization of the surrounding territory, which fell in the coveted urban territory. Urban category. The price of land skyrocketed. As her father's land fell in this commercial area, he sold off his three acres at one crore per acre. Rekha prompted by her, by her in-laws asked for a share in the sale of the land. In return, all that she was given was some pieces of jewelry. She realized that she put it, the unfairness of it all. Consequently, she asked her father for her proper share. Why should my father discriminate between me and my two brothers, she inquired. Till date, that is 2011, she had not received her share. During the interview, Rekha agitatedly complained that both her brothers were unemployed. Yet, they were still enjoying themselves on this money. While she was constantly being attacked and taunted by her husband and father-in-law about a share which her father had not so far handed over to. Clearly, there was emotional and psychological pressure on Rekha, which had intensified in the wake of the sale of the land by her father. When asked where society was now accepting the daughter's share in the father's property, her husband, underlining the changing norms, maintained very insightfully. He said, society does not say anything. All households are now facing such demands from their daughters who are claiming their share and in fact even getting it. Only money matters. This is especially so that the relationship between the in-laws starts for some reason. As in our case, I hope the eventuality of moving the court doesn't arise. So far neither have we moved the court to claim they her share nor have they given her share to us. Let us see what happens in the future. It may be added here that claiming money or supporting the wife to claim money is far easier for the husband as instead of land, money can be taken shansi. As one man put it, the money transaction also makes the husband of the recipient escape the possible slur of being a ghadimai, a position by and large still considered somewhat demeaning, which I shall de deal with presently. Even those women who ask for the share of land, which many have financially, from financially weak conjugal homes do so, they generally sell it off for the same reasons. Indeed, cases are steadily growing where women are claiming their share even after several years of not claiming it and despite there being a male heir. I shall just cite two cases out of the many that I came across. The first one is that of Anaru Devi, a Chamar by caste, worked as an agricultural labor in Pesh Dujana of district Chajar. After the death of her husband three years ago, finding it difficult to make her two ends meet, Anaru decided to ask for her share in land in her father's property. The two acres of land was then in the exclusive control of her two brothers. Significantly, this demand was made 20 years after she had been married and was greatly resented by her brothers. Feeling bitter, they threatened her that they would disown her as their sister and would have nothing to do with her. Her younger sister did not claim her share and considered Anaru's action totally wrong and stopped all communication with her. After claiming her share, Anura, Anaru sold off the land and brought two milk cattle. She now makes enough income from the sale of the milk, showing her metal. She maintained that for taking her share, she had to put up with a lot of taunts from her kinsmen and the villagers. The second case is that of Dhanpati, a Jat woman from a village in Rothik district. Married at the age of 16 some 40 years ago. Their assets consisted of two acres of land and their pension, altogether considered inadequate for their needs. Dhanpati and her three sisters had not laid any claim to their parental property. Her two brothers had consequently inherited two acres each from her father, from their father. Out of the two brothers, 
the younger one had been close to the four sisters and had observed all the rituals by presenting them with kothli, that is, gift on social and festive occasions. He was unmarried and died early. The older brother had always been very unpleasant to his sisters. He didn't observe any of the rituals and, in fact, did not allow his sisters even to visit him. When the sisters staked their share in their father's property, they altogether got one acre in 2001, which they sold off to someone in their native village itself. The sale got them two lakh rupees, which was distributed among the four of them, that is 50,000 each. Belonging to a region that remains critical of the daughters claiming their share, especially if there is a son or brother to inherit it, Dhanpati, during the interview, felt the need to justify her actions. Rationalizing her initiative, she said, I claimed my share as my brother was misbehaving with me and my sister and not fulfilling his brotherly obligations. Only one of his sisters has any regrets. After this incident, the relationship between the brother and his four, and his four sisters totally broke down. It is well known that if the sisters were to claim what is legally theirs, they have to completely write off all relationship with the natal family. Interestingly, when this move to claim their share was under consideration, Dhanpati's husband and those of her sisters had encouraged them to take the share. More and more cases of the husband and or the conjugal family encouraging the Bahu to stake her claim to inheritance are coming up, underlining the growing male support to the female inheritance. This is in spite of the likely public censure which the family may have to endure. Cultural patterns are set to change, though not without some protests. The effect of having claimed her share became visible very soon. In Dhanpati's words, our, that is us, the sisters, condition improved after we claimed our property. Out of the money Dhanpati received from the sale of the property, she brought a, she bought a buffalo whose milk is providing sustenance to her entire family. For the rest of the money, her husband suggested that they convert their kacha house into a pakka one. She agreed, as it had not been possible for them to have a pakka house earlier. Because of lack of finances, it may be noticed that after claiming her share, not only has the quality of life changed for the better, but Dhanpati has also come to assume a position from, she's, from where she's taking both individual and joint actions, decisions, sorry. One of the major reasons why a daughter's sister may be wary of claiming a share in the property of father is the negative connotation associated with the word ghargyamari. In Uttar Pradesh, Punjab, and Haryana, the cultural prejudice against ghargyamari among landowning caste group is so strong that it has become the butt of many jokes and stories. In ordinary circumstances, a son-in-law is treated with honor and respect especially when he's on a visit to his wife's village. Great respect is shown to him, not only by the wife's immediate kinsmen, but also by her classificatory king, such as her lineage, males, and fellow villagers. In fact, in the whole of northern India, he is generally referred to as Bateu or Mehman, both words literally meaning a guest, and his honor lies in remaining a Jamai and not a Ghar Jamai. The colleges would like to see an outsider, would not like to see an outsider taking a share of the ancestral property. So if he were to go and live in his wife's village and become Dhajamai, he would be despised and would incur considerable shame. But in reality, things are changing. I should just speak out one case from Rotec district out of quite a few that I came across regarding women inheriting property and turning of a jamari into a ghar jamari. This case underlines the continuing and even an acceleration of a change in Haryanvi rural society, which is on its way to accept a significant breach in the time-honored 
tradition of that locality by relocating her husband in the native village of the wife and allowing and accepting the daughter and her husband to take over the ancestral property. Such a move has always been vehemently resisted by the family members, the collaterals, the community, as well as the villagers. The case shows the most respected Jemai turning into a Ghar Jemai, but with hardly any negative connotations in real life. Some reservations may still be there, but they have not proved to be of any great hindrance in the daughters taking over their property. This is a case in which two brothers who got married to two sisters translocated themselves from their own village to their wife's village, became Ghajimais, and have been successfully cultivating the land of their father-in-law without incurring any social disapproval or strictures confirming winds of change. In village Ballam of Rodak district, a Gujar family of Banwari, 82 years of age, and Shambhai, 72 years old, both unable, ailing and unable to cultivate their 11-acre land holding, invited their two sons-in-law to stay with them and cultivate the land on their behalf. This was in the year 2000. The sons-in-law agreed, as their own ancestral land was a mere five acres, and also not so fertile, which that day, that is, five brothers jointly held and cultivated in a village in Bhivani district. Their own land, were it to be divided, would have meant uneconomic holding of just one acre each for the five brothers. Interestingly, the Ballam village folk do not condemn these Ghajamites suggesting a certain reversal of opinion that has been gradually taking place in rural areas. The villagers, both men and women, opine that the two brothers are the village Bateu, who always give them, that is the villagers, full respect and are respected in return. Once when accidentally the neighboring field caught fire from the actions of one of the Jemais, the village panchayat refused to impose any penalty as they would have invariably done in any other case and was satisfied with the apology tendered by the Jemais. Explaining this, they said, how can we impose fine on our own daughters? After all, it is our daughters who are the owners of this land. Regarding the property going to her daughters, the mother, Shambhari, had the following to say. We have made a will leaving our 11 acres of land to be divided equally between our two daughters. No one has any objections, neither the collaterals, nor my husband's brothers, who had received their own share of 11 acres each some 50 years ago, nor any of the villagers. Clearly, the collaterals appear to have accepted they ouster from direct acquisition of property as a matter of right, which they had felt earlier. Now this acquisition can only be made through purchase. Undoubtedly, they have their reservations regarding daughters taking over the property, but these have not been of any great hindrance. The acceptance and cordiality also emanates from the fact that the village community is hopeful of the girls selling off the land, in which case the neighbors are likely to get preference. There are several such cases in which the brotherless married sisters have inherited the property and shifted their husbands to take over. Another well-known case is that of Kamala Devi, Brahman by caste, who shifted the, with her husband to her natal village, Mehman, in Rota district. After her parents' death, to look after the six acres of land which they had owned. Kamla has two more sisters, consequently her father divided the property into three, leaving two acres each to his three daughters. Although the husbands of Kamla's sister did not shift, Kamla's husband did. He has two other brothers and was encouraged by Kamla's mother-in-law to shift to his wife's little home. Kamla maintains that she divides the income fairly and honestly into three shares, one for herself and the other two for her sisters. In all this, her husband and his family, as well as sisters and their families, 
has supported her fully. A few people have certainly been critical of her. Their two-fold objections are objections customarily made. One, they have told her to stop all mardon ka kaam, which she had to undertake due to her husband's acute illness. And two, to go back to her sufral, which alone according to them she was entitled to. Agreeing to the first charge, Kamala Devi significantly confirmed, for the last 14 years, I have been managing like a man. It's explaining this, Kamala elaborated, if I had not taken over the land, it would have been misappropriated by, by my charger town. And we would not have been able to do anything. Now, I stand in place of a brother for both my sisters, fulfilling all the social and ritual obligations that a brother is expected to observe towards his sister, like bhaat and kotli, etc. And even provided with a place that is little home, they can visit when they like. In other words, property acquisition by the woman in certain cases has meant a de facto female-headed household. In a complete role reversal, the entire agricultural work from sowing onwards to the selection of crops and marketing, including household and animal husbandry, work is being performed by her. This cannot be turned as a major change and a very welcome one. There are also cases in which the fathers, despite having sons, take the lead in getting the share of property to their daughters. Yet others are willing to look after their daughters in case the marriage collapses for some reason. I shall recount just one such case, underlying the, underlining the changes regarding property rights, surfacing not only among women but also among men. Bimla Jat by caste from a village in this Bhivani was just 16 years of age when she was married off. Unable to tolerate marital violence, Bimla sought a legal divorce from her husband. However, by the time she took this step, she had had two children, a girl and a boy. In this demand, she was fully supported by her father, an ex-army officer, who was in the know of her violent marital relationship. She succeeded in getting the divorce, the custody of her children, as well as maintenance for herself and her children. Linda had four siblings, two sisters and two brothers. The father had divided his property equally before between his four sons, four children. After her divorce, Bibla's father also gifted her house to live in. Complications, complications emerged when one of her brothers died at the age of 37, leaving behind a daughter. The younger brother, as the only male heir, started to put pressure on the father to make over the entire property to him, including the house that had been gifted to Kumla. The father resisted this demand as long as he was alive. After his death, the pressure and the demands increased. Bimla's brother demanded that the mother who was living with Bimla should shift with him and he should get the benefit of a pension as well as the interest from the fixed deposit that her father had left in the name of the mother. Indeed, old age pension in Haryana has merged as a potent reason for the frequent fights between male siblings over the custody of their old parents. The brother when interviewed was defiant and aggressive about these demands and felt, this is when I interviewed him, that he was fully justified in making them. Many in the village, Gabri and other relatives, were also of the opinion that he was the son, and it was son's right to get all the property. The mother and two sisters, however, refused all these demands. Interestingly, the younger sister's conjugal family also put pressure upon their bahu not to be a part of this arrangement. They argued, old customs and traditions must be honored, and these decrees property must go to the son or sons, and parents should live the son instead of the daughters. I later discovered that they had a married daughter, so perhaps was afraid of making this demand, as the reciprocal demand from the other side may have been made, or they may be accused of double standards. 
Limra is now 57 years old and lives with four of her family members in his heart. She has with her mother the deceased brother's daughter as well as her own son and daughter. In conclusion, I may reiterate that it is undeniable that regarding rights of inheritance of women, the dominant vocal opinion in this region, both of men and women remained antagonistic and unsympathetic. This is reflected even in the unhelpful approach of many of the government and political functionaries who share the dominant prevailing social biases with its strong male resistance to female inheritance of land. They do not take kindly to such claims and often obstruct the implementation of laws favoring women in the absence of an effective and encouraging state support system, women are also reluctant to claim their inheritance or even vocalize their rights. Despite a very high awareness of such rights, they either reiterate the male reasoning in asserting male entitlement or offer cultural, moral and emotional justification for not claiming their share. However, the legacy of custom, cultural constraints and prejudices against women inheriting land and property, apparent in the present day dominant local opinion, has not entirely prevented females who are now legally enabled to inherit from staking claims to their share of property in rural Haryana. The stray cases and aftermath of legal enablement have steadily grown over the years. Slowly the changes are coming noticeably to the surface. In fact, as a result of these changes, it can also not be denied that the Haryanavi situation has turned into one of potential violence from females born out of male anxiety to control them. In fact, the murder of women in such cases where inheritance rights may be claimed or are being claimed is openly acknowledged. The recent sprout in the cases of honor killing can also be directly related to this growing phenomenon. The current drive for consolidation of traditional forces in the form of car panchayats and the punitive measures adopted by them to tighten the news of control of females married or unmarried, as well as the renewed efforts to do away with laws that sanctify and give validity to property claims of women, are crucially related to the accumulative impact of such claims that they are having in this region. These norms not only go against the laws of the land, but are also social anomalies in the greatly changed political economy of today's Haryana, which boasts of being modern state with highest per capita income. Clearly, the drive for change and opposition to this change coexist in contemporary Haryanavi society. Changing social attitudes and cultural patterns takes time and is going to require an enormous and concerted effort. In order to accelerate these changes, there is an urgent need to do away the difference between legal recognition of a claim and its social recognition, and also between recognition and enforcement. Thank you for giving such a patient.